Welcome to the Westside Investors Network. Win your community of investing knowledge for growth. This is the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast for real estate professionals by real estate professionals. This show is focused on the next step in your career, investing. Thank you for listening. And please, if you like our content, rate us on your podcast provider. Just a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are for educational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any shares or securities, make or consider any investments or take any other action. And now, AJ and Chris Shepard. Hello, and welcome to the West Side Investors Network. This year, we're launching a new segment on the show, The Deal Deep Dive. These are many episodes where our featured guests will share their unique stories on a specific deal they've participated in. We will go deep on all aspects of the deal, from finding it to making the offer, due diligence, and more. Do us a solid and smash that subscribe button, leave us a rating, and further your investing journey. Welcome back to another Deal Deep Dive segment. Today we have Travis Watts with us. Travis, thanks for joining me. And hey, I know, Trent. I know yeah, our listeners man. are going to get a lot out of this conversation. So Travis, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us about who you are and what you do. Sure, man. Thanks, Trent, so much for having me. This is a fun segment. I rarely get to talk deals. So I'm going to talk a deal today that is not an Ashcroft Capital deal. A lot of people know me as Director of Investor Education with Ashcroft Capital. So quick backstory. Started in real estate in 2009, like a lot of people do. My little bubble window of context was if you're a real estate investor, then you buy a single family home in your own, you know, backyard, so to speak, and you rent it out. And so started that way, did the house hacking and roommate stuff, later got into vacation rentals and fix and flips. And meanwhile, I was a busy W-2 worker and I was working, you know, 14 hour days, 98 hours per week. It was insane. And it was really hard to scale up owning all these single family homes on the side. It got more and more active every single year. And after about six and a half years, I just, I burned out, man. And I just, I didn't know what to do. I was thinking everything from just give up on real estate to invest in the stock market. And, you know, I just, I wanted to be passive is what I wanted. I just didn't know how to articulate that. And so I started listening to podcasts like yours. I started reading books. I started getting involved with these local real estate meetup clubs and stuff like that. And ironically, in 2015, I ran into two guys who had sold their businesses in the mid-1990s and became kind of multimillionaires overnight, right? They just had this windfall of equity, never saw that coming in their trajectory. It just happened. And they became what was called a full-time passive investor or a full-time limited partner in syndications, real estate, private placements. And this was all jargon and foreign to me, sound like a pipe dream. But these guys actually sat down with me to explain this stuff and show me their portfolio and talk about what happened in the recession. And I really got interested in this idea that I could be a limited partner investor. I don't have to be the guy boots on the ground, managing tenants and toilets and termites and being a professional landlord. I could just get monthly cash flow, equity appreciation, use leverage, get tax advantages, and I can let someone else do everything from finding the deal, underwriting the deal, managing the deal, managing the tenants, and then executing a sale. So I fell in love with that model. I was a bit skeptical. So I had this single family home that was selling in 2015. And I said, okay, I'm going to try this, but I'm still skeptical. So I'm going to take a portion of my equity out of that sale and I'm going to do one of these deals. I'm just going to see how it goes. So I let it ride for about six months. I was getting paid monthly. The reporting was good. The business plan was getting done. And I said, okay, this is the path I want to go on. I want to be just like these guys. And so those are my two mentors and kind of how it evolved. And I ended up selling all my single family homes and going into multifamily syndications full time from 2015 and 16. And by 2017, I was just full blown LP. And one of the groups I'd been investing heavily with was Ashcroft Capital and Joe Fairless. So when his daughter was born, his firstborn, I said, look, man, I have a passion for educating people and putting the word out there about this stuff. I mean, it's truly like, I feel like this is my calling. This is what I should be doing. I said, let me get on stage. I can run booths. I can do podcasts. I can do webinars. I can just tell me what to do and call me whatever you want to call me. 
And so, you know, that became my involvement with Joe and the team over there. And so continue investing with them through this day and just a passion for educating mostly accredited investors on diversifying portfolios. There's more than just a 401k in the stock market. There's a lot out there and real estate has some tremendous benefits. So that's kind of how we got from A to B. There was a lot there. And I definitely have some questions about that. First question, do you invest in the stock market or only real estate now? Good question. So in the last several years, we'll say since maybe 2016, I've personally felt like the stock market was a little overvalued. So when you think about things like publicly traded REITs, real estate investment trusts, I just felt like I was overpaying for the same kinds of properties that I could invest in privately and pay true market value for. Now, with the exception of this year, we're recording this in late 2022, the stock market's plummeted and a lot of REITs have a high correlation to the broader stock market. So they have been pulled down for mostly not good reasons, not like their assets aren't performing, not like cash flow is not happening, just because the broader indexes are down. So I do buy into REITs and I do buy into covered call ETFs and I'll buy into basically anything out there <laughs> that produces monthly passive income and has potential equity upside down the road. So I'm a dip buyer when it comes to the stock market. And when it's 20 and 30% down, I'm a buyer. And when it's 20, 30% up, I'm in the private placement world full time. Awesome. And I know one thing about REITs in the stock market is they typically offer a pretty good dividend compared to other publicly traded companies. So is that one thing that you look at when you invest in REITs? Yeah, it's funny, you know, for a short stint of my career, I worked at a very large brokerage firm, one of the largest in the world, got licensed, did all that kind of stuff. And when they would talk about cash flow and passive investing, I always laugh because they're talking about these blue chip companies that pay you one or two percent a year and call that cash flow. And it's like, man, and meanwhile, I've got this whole portfolio of real estate giving me 10 and 12 and 15 percent cash flow. <laughs> and it was kind of a joke. So to your point, when the market's up, the stock market, the REITs don't have a super high dividend. It's usually lower than a private placement. So we'll call it, you know, three, four, maybe 5% annualized. But when you have markets like this year where things have tanked and they haven't cut dividends, then some of those yields went up to 10, 11, and 12% annualized. And you're still owning the underlying real estate, you know, a proportional shares of it. So they do, to answer your question, have traditionally a higher yield than something like, I don't even know, AT&T or something, you know, <laughs> one of those blue chip companies that pays out a menial dividend. Right. And then going back to, you know, you, you talked about flipping houses and doing that for a yeah. handful of years. What was the learning curve like going from single family home flips to really being able to understand the multifamily investment side as an LP investor for you? I think two things were the light bulb moment. And the first thing was that I realized about myself that my skill set is not a handyman. My skill set is not building teams of contractors and realtors and trying to find off market deals. It's not really negotiating. It's not really anything that you need to be successful in flipping homes. I was mostly lucky because of market timing, because I was flipping mostly through like 2013, 14 and 15. So as the market and I was out in Colorado, by the way, if we want to talk about markets in kind of the Denver and Front Range area. So honestly, if the market had been completely flat, my yields would have been very, very marginal. And so the second thing was learning about private placements and a value add strategy and how on projections, I'm zooming back and putting myself in that frame of mind in 2015, you look at one of these projections and it says you might get a 20% IRR, internal rate of return, you know, combining the equity plus the cash flow, right? And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, man, I'm hardly getting that if I'm getting that doing all the work myself. So what am I doing? I'm not even paying myself for my time and I'm stressing myself out and I don't have time to vacation and I don't have time to have a relationship. And, you know, I was just very, very frustrated. So those were the two things that kind of led me to make the leap over. And it was just learning about myself, man. You know, people make crazy money in flips and you got to be good and you got to be competitive and you got to have all those skill sets lined up and I just didn't. So it just wasn't the right fit. Okay. And then in terms of learning how, because I mean, analyzing a flip property where you're trying to buy something well under market, understanding the rehab costs, and then your ARV, 
Yeah. That's all one skill set from what, you know, from my experience. But when it comes to analyzing multifamily deals, how did you learn that aspect before officially investing once you sold that final multifamily or that single family deal? Yeah. Great question. And of course, there's websites and books and courses and all these things that you can buy into and learn. My most effective method was to find people who were already doing what it is I wanted to do successfully and making them my mentor, whether that meant unpaid or paid. That was always the most effective because I could ask real questions. I could say, here's a deal. What do you think about this and this and this? And what does this mean? And what's DSCR mean? And, you know, all this stuff. A book, you know, is good to teach you like basic terminology and basic concepts, but you can't ask a book questions, you know? So when you finish that last page and then you start looking at deals and you're like, ah, you know, I don't understand how this works. You can't really find the answer to that. So I read books like the best ever apartment syndication book that Joe Fairless wrote, of course, he's GP of Ashcroft, read that way back when, when he first released it, it was like 2016, I think. And The Hands-Off Investor by Brian Burke is a great book. That one came out a few years ago. And that's all about being a limited partner. So you just learn from people, you learn from networking, you learn from experience. There were deals that I went into that I didn't understand some of what was happening, you know, and it turned out that was the red flag that I missed. (laughs) So live and learn, man. You got to get your feet wet a little bit. Awesome. Okay. Now let's talk about the deal that you want to talk about today. Can you explain, you know, a little bit of the parameters on it? How many units, what kind of property, that kind of thing? Yeah. And the reason I want to talk about this particular deal, it's not an Ashcroft Capital deal. This is, and by the way, I've partnered with probably 14, 15, maybe 16 operators in the space, right? So I'm not just glued to the hip with one operator. I like to diversify. It's part of the reason of being a limited partner. I can be in different markets and different business plans and all that. So the reason I'm talking about this deal is A, it just sold last week. And so it's fresh on my mind. And two, I've been on podcasts before saying things like, I tend not to do student deals, which means that, you know, students have signed up for some kind of program and they're learning the business and then they go out and they syndicate a deal. I generally don't do that. But in this case, I did. And it was a great deal that worked out. So the first thing I did years and years ago when I started getting more serious about this, and I want to make this a long term, you know, trajectory for me is I started identifying what are my goals and objectives? Why am I even investing at all? And where am I trying to get? And what lifestyle am I looking to create? And then what investment vehicle could potentially get me there? And the thing I like about value add, private placement, you know, syndications, whatever you want to call them, is you have all those elements, like I mentioned earlier, you have monthly cash flow, you have equity upside, you have tax advantages, you have leverage. And I understand the business model coming from single family and smaller deals. So this deal came across my desk. I knew one of the co-GPs will say there was probably four or five, because again, it was a student deal. And it was a 419 unit, I believe. It was in Dallas, Texas. This was about three years ago. And at that time, I was doing a lot of Texas investing. And so that's how I kind of started is branching out from the Dallas market, getting into Florida and Georgia and Carolinas and Phoenix and other places. So it just fit my criteria. I had already said I want Sunbelt markets. I want value add business plans. I want you know a certain amount of cash flow, a particular type of IRR. I want a preferred return. I want you know all this stuff. So this checked almost all the boxes minus a couple. One, it was a student deal. They didn't exactly have tremendous track record at that point. But again, I knew one of the guys personally. I really is stand up guy. Trust him with anything. You know, of course, to manage my money. So. That's what the deal was. It was about, if I believe, like 39, maybe $40 million. So it was an older property, like early 80s, I believe. So that breaks down to like 95,000 a unit or something. So in Dallas, even three years ago, that was a good cost per door, you know? And that was exactly the type of deal I was looking for. They projected a five-year hold on it. And uh, I think it was like a quarterly distributions, which is not my favorite, but I really like the deal. That was kind of the scope of what it was. Awesome. One quick question. I know this isn't necessarily about this deal, but you talked about monthly distributions for a lot of your investments. Yeah. I've only ever heard of quarterly distributions personally. What would you say the percentage of your current investments are monthly versus quarterly? 
80 to 90 percent. And the reason is that I live on cash flow. And so it's like, do you want to get paid quarterly or monthly? Well, if you have the choice, probably monthly. (laughs) So, So that's my preference. And that goes well outside of syndications. If I'm going to do a REIT, it's going to be a monthly paying REIT. If I do ATM machines, they pay me monthly. If I do car washes, they pay me monthly. If I do note lending, it pays me monthly. So anything I ever invest in is mostly monthly with the exception of this deal that we're talking about and a handful of others where I really just loved everything else about the deal. And that wasn't going to hold me up just because I wanted to be a stickler on the distribution frequency. All right. So I think we know how you got the capital to invest in the deal from the sale of your last single family home, correct? Was that this one? From, well, from multiple. I had sold numerous single family deals. I went really totally liquid. I even sold the house that I lived in. I really was serious about, I'm going to pay all the tax, which is, I'm not saying this is the smartest move. I could have done a lot of more you know, creative tax strategies, but I sold everything. I paid all the realtor commissions. I went true net worth. And I had calculated this ahead of time, of course, on paper on an Excel sheet. Mm -hmm. And I said, what if I start putting this money, whatever my net is, into syndications one at a time? And back in 2015, it wasn't uncommon for cash flow to be about 8% in year one right out of the gate on something like what we're talking about. So I felt like that was conservative. And some of the things I invest in have higher yields than that, like note lending, for example, I was getting like 12%. So I wanted to average. 8% of my portfolio. And I still actually keep that average today, believe it or not, even though cap rates and yield have come down because of all the interest in the space. But I still do investments like we're talking about beat up REITs and other things that have double digit cash flow and older multifamily properties that haven't sold that every year just keep increasing in yield. So I live off 8% cash flow is the answer to that. So I lost point of your question. (laughs) What was the question I'm getting at? No, that you answered it. How did you fund your LP investments? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So one more point on that. W-2 job I still had up until, you know, 2016 and stuff. And so that was a six-figure salary kind of thing. I was living very, very frugally. I was saving as much as I could save. I sold all my properties. I had a lump sum and I just started going into these deals. You can run the math like this. 1.25 1.25 million times 8% a year is 100K, you know, just for simple math. Not saying those were my exact numbers, but for simple math, that's how I thought about it. Yeah. And so I thought, okay, I have enough to be able to do this and to replace my W 2 job. And, but I never stopped my active income sources. I still do a lot of things that are active income, but I don't do it because it's a job. I don't do it because I have to go clock into the cubicle every week. I do things I enjoy doing and I, get paid to do that. So (laughs) awesome. So from and we've talked about analyzing a syndication deal or a potential larger multifamily deal from the GP side or the operator side. How did you look at these deals or how do you look at these deals from an LP side when you get the PPM and the, you know, the offering memory and all that good stuff? How do you analyze a deal that you're thinking about investing in? Yeah, in a general sense. So it's very important for a limited partner, if you're going to do what I do, to get your foundation set. Now, you can do that in so many ways. You can go through the ringer like I did with doing your own deals and learn it the hard way. You can read books, you can find mentors, but you need to start establishing. Again, you start with your goals, at least this is what I do. And then I reverse engineer. And then it's like, okay, a value add syndication makes a lot of sense. Okay. Now, which markets do you like? So I look at the national stats and I like the Sun Belt because a lot of New York, New Jersey, Illinois, California, they're all moving down to Texas and Florida and you know the Carolinas, Georgia. So I like migration trends like that. And they're lower cost of living. They're generally speaking, better weather. They're tax-free states in the example of Texas and Florida. So I look for that kind of stuff. I look at landlord-tenant laws. You know, So this is all establishing my criteria And then when it comes down to the deal itself, I want to know who's the operator, what's their track record and experience. Ironically, the deal we're talking about was a student deal. So that was kind of not checked off. Uh, I look at the school systems. I look at the comps in the area. I jump on apartments.com and I look at comparable rents and properties in the area. So if they tell me, for example, if an operator says, we're going to buy this property and we're going to jack the rents up 500 a month. Well, I have to know that that's realistic. I have to go look at comps and say, you know, is a 1980 property really going to compete with a class A luxury apartment building? Maybe not, right? So 
as compared to maybe we're going to lift the rents 150 over a three to five year time frame, and that's going to bring it up to the market rent. And that seems a lot more realistic. So I look at what cap rate are they buying at? What cap rate do they anticipate selling at? I always want that number to be higher on the back end, no matter what's happening in the market. It just shows how conservative they're being. And I want a preferred return, which is not a guarantee or a promise, but it's putting the LP's interest first. It's saying, hey, you guys get the first 7% of the cash flow on this deal before we start putting our hands in the pot and sharing in the profits. And so I like that. And I also like to work with GPs who put their own personal money in the deal as an LP at the same terms that I'm getting. And so if the ship is sinking, they're more inclined to try to save it as compared to, you know, like the whole Wall Street stuff, you know, you should buy all these mutual funds, even though I don't buy them, but and I don't have any money in them. <laughs> That's fair. So you're almost analyzing the deal. I don't want to say from a GP side, but you're looking at all the same things that a GP would. You're just doing your own research and comparing the numbers that they're giving you. What I'm doing really, if we simplify it down to as simple as we can make it, I'm a trust, but verify, okay. you know? Give me the information, give me the stats, give me the fact, give me the average household income, give me the average comps. Then I go do my own research and I verify that, you know? And if it makes sense, it makes sense. And sometimes it's just too aggressive, you know? They're given too high of a pref or they're saying cap rates are going to compress and the market's just going to go crazy. I don't buy into that stuff. And I also don't buy into personally the equity upside projections. Okay. Cause I'm a cash flow focused investor. I want to know, does it cash flow day one? And how realistic is it that we can raise that yield over the next three to five years versus, oh, you're telling me I'm going to double my money in five years. I'm in because it may not happen, you know? And so a lot of investors have to kind of put themselves in that frame of reference that these are just projected returns. There are no promises or guarantees. And so you always got to keep that in mind. Do you have any software or tools that you use when you're analyzing a market? Like if you haven't invested in a market, are there any websites or software that you use to get a better idea of the schools and the areas? You know, honestly, I just use the stuff that is available to all of us for free. You know, Google Maps, Google Street Views. I go, you know, kind of drive virtually around mm -hmm. these properties and neighborhoods. You can pull up crime stats for free, you know, on any municipality. What else do I do? I'm always leveraging the research from Marcus and Millichap and CBRE and all these platforms that are out there, you know, giving you the data, looking at U-Haul statistics and where people are moving to. And so, you know, markets don't change that fast. You know, if Dallas is, just to use that as an example, if that's a prime market today for a lot of reasons, it's not like in six months, Dallas isn't the place to be anymore. <laughs> you right. know, that takes years and years and years to evolve out of being favorable, mm -hmm. generally speaking. So it's a front-loaded business is what I tell people who want to be a limited partner. You have to do your homework. You have to find some mentors. You need to find some operators. You need to start looking at deals. You need to learn how to vet them. But once you do kind of your homework phase, it gets easier and easier and easier. And even though I've invested with you know 15 plus operators, these days I'm reeling it back in to those who truly have under-promised and over-delivered. And I already know the team and I already trust the team and I already know their philosophy and I already know what markets they're in. I already know that, you know, their track record. So it just gets easier when a firm saying, here's a new offering and I've already done 10 with them. You know, it's not like it's a no-brainer. I'm just going to do it. I'm still going to go through my due diligence, but it's a hell of a lot easier. I could do due diligence in probably 20 minutes instead of two and a half hours. <laughs> right, right. So for this deal in Dallas specifically, what was the projected IRR? What yeah. ended up being the IRR if it was higher or less? And yeah. Yep. So they this? projected a, if I remember correctly, it was a 80% total return on your money in a five-year hold period is what it was. And the majority of that was coming from the equity on the back end. But the cash flow was strong on projections. And I felt like they were being very realistic. And it was, they always paid out and it was about eight to eight and a half percent. Again, this was a deal happened about three years ago, roughly. Mm -hmm. So I was getting my quarterly distributions at about eight and a half yield, which again, met my goals, my criteria, my objectives, right? 
And they ended up selling last week and finally closed it. It had two extensions at a 88% total return. So an LP that put 100,000 in got 188,000 back. Some of that through cash flow, maybe 30 grand. The rest of it through equity upon the sale, you know. And the cool thing is, it sold early. It sold in three years instead of five. So I call that the velocity of capital. I like these deals that you get into, you fix them up, and as soon as they're done, you market them, you sell them if the market's good, and you get out and you redeploy your money. And so I'll take a deal like that and say I did put 100k in, and now I have 188 pay a little bit of tax on the back end. I don't do 1031s myself. And then I'll add some money from my own pocket back to it and make it a smooth, even 200. And I'll go do two deals. I'll do 100 over here and 100 over here. So I just turned my original 100K into almost 200K. And now I have two streams of income. And then if they do the same business model and sell in three to five years, then I'll do four deals. And so it's a little bit of a snowball and it takes some time. You know, this is not a get rich quick kind of business, but it is a compounding effect, you know, and it's amazing that we all start with one deal and I'm at 50 plus at this point. And it just, it doesn't really make sense to me how that happened because <laughs> yeah. it goes fast, man. You have deals sometimes sell early and you just keep diversifying. So at least that's what I have done. When you get an offering and you're analyzing it, how intently are you analyzing the debt that's associated with the acquisition of that property and the capital improvement plans, that kind of thing? That's a great question. And it's more relevant today than ever. You know, we've just come out of an era where it was like really low interest rates, just hovering down for years and years and years and going lower and lower and lower. And that's, you know, who doesn't want to be in that environment when you're in real estate? So lots of refinances were happening and just, it was crazy, man. 3% loans. My wife and I got like a 2.75 loan on our house, you know, last September. That's just insane to think about. And now they're like 7% for a 30 year mortgage. So to answer your question, if I'm going in a deal today, especially, and let's say they're getting a mortgage at 6% or something like that. So first of all, I want to know how long is the anticipated hold period? And let's say that they tell me five years. I've got to see debt on that that's at least five years, but ideally like seven to 10 years on the term, ideally in a perfect world. I would love to have fixed rate in a lot of different cases. But if it is adjustable on the loan, and a lot of private loans are like that, then they have to be buying an interest rate cap because we don't know where the Fed is going to take rates. And so that's like almost like an insurance policy that if you got a 6% loan, it caps you out at, say, 7%. So if the Fed says we're going to 10 well, you're capped out at seven. Mm -hmm. I like assumable loans where a future buyer can take over your loan at potentially a lower interest rate than what's being offered down the road. And we just have to realize there's probably going to be less refinancing happening because interest rates are going up and not down. And so you want to have some wiggle room that a lot of the sellers right now had you know, temporary bridge loans and stuff like that. They're at the end of their debt term. And now these mortgage rates have gone so high up that it may not even make sense to continue on with the business plan. And a lot of them are just having to sell. And right now we're seeing a lot of discounts between 10 to 25%, depending on the market that we're talking about. So not really the best time to be selling if you don't have to. And so that's the whole point. If you think you can turn a property in three years, put five to seven years of debt on it. And that way, when three years comes up and you can't sell for some reason or don't want to, you don't have to. And at least you have a cash flowing asset that you can keep holding through that tough time. If we think back at 2008, 9, and 10, the Great Recession, Class B multifamily rents fell about $125 per month nationwide, which A, is not a catastrophic rent drop, number one. But those who had defaults, which were less than 1% on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans, we're nearing that debt term, you know, and a lot of people were forced to sell at a terrible time, but that recovery popped back in like a year and a half. So if you were able to just hold on for an extra year and a half from the very bottom of 2009 or whenever it bottomed out, you would have been back at pre-crash rents, basically, which were about twelve twenty-five a month on Class B. So something to think about. That was one thing that really that I mentioned earlier about my mentors that got me really interested in long-term multifamily investing to think 
that may be one of the worst real estate crises that I may see in my lifetime. And 99% of those loans survived on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And so that tells you something, you know, how many people lost single family homes? Millions, you know, it's just a different game at the small level. So, right. And now here's a word from our sponsor. Get things done while you're on the move. Learn more about working with a virtual assistant through offsite professionals. It's a great way to get all the things done that you need to get done. Have freedom in your time and streamline your life by automating your business. Stop spending time on the tasks that you can delegate and start spending more time on your superpower. Call us today at 503-446-3177 or visit our website at offsiteprofessionals.com. So going on to the capital improvement plans, I know you've kind of touched on, you focus on cash flow and you're not really focused or honed in on the upside cap or the upside, you know, appreciation and that sort of thing. Yeah. Are you looking at, I know you're looking at value add, but are you looking at rent increase value add? Are you looking at property management inefficiency improvements? Are you looking at a bunch of unit turns? What? Yeah. What let me of- give you some examples of some things that we do at Ashcroft, for example. So say we're buying, well, we just closed on a property not too long ago, it was 2010 built. Okay. So we were the first group to come in and start a value add plan, right? Because the thing's only 12 years old. But 12 years is a long time for appliances and for roofs and for technology. So we come in and we'll do things like, and not every property is going to have all of these things. It just depends on what was already done or what wasn't. But let's say it wasn't a pet friendly property. Well, we make it one and we put in a dog park and we do fenced in ground level yards and we charge a premium and we do covered car parking that someone can pay an extra 50 bucks a month to shelter their car from the elements. You know, we do profit sharing with TV and internet and cable and home security services. We take that had a laundry mat for whatever reason, probably wouldn't be on a 2010, but on a 1980s or something. We'll put the washers and dryers in the units and we'll charge again, 75 a month to have that luxury, which is a huge win-win for both residents and for us. Mm -hmm. And then there's some things you'll do that don't have an exact correlation to an ROI. So like, say it's got an old gym with like a couple treadmills and a workout machine, you know? So we'll scrap that. We'll put in, you know, the Peloton bikes and the, you know, the Bowflex systems or whatever, you know, whatever the latest and greatest is. And we'll knock a wall down perhaps and expand the gym to be even bigger. So more people can use it. We put barbecue pits out there. We do package locker systems, which is another like for Amazon deliveries and package deliveries. It's a secured way for our residents to just get a text message. You got a package. They walk down to the clubhouse, type in a code. It's open 24 seven and there's no people stealing packages off of porches. We do valet trash service. I mean, I could go on and on and on. We do so much, but that's what I mean by value add in addition to what you would expect, which is, you know, rebranding, new signage, new landscaping, redo the clubhouse, modernize the units, put granite or quartz countertops, stainless appliances, pop the colors, put crown molding. We do new light fixtures, sinks, faucets, toilets. So we make these truly better quality properties and a better living environment for the residents. You know, a lot of the older properties will have like a tennis court or a racquetball court or something that people aren't using anymore. It's all run down and crappy. So we come in and we'll put a running park around it and a grass area in the middle and a kid play park and picnic tables with a barbecue area. And so we try to accommodate to the most we try to make it a more usable space for more people who live on site at the property and make it a little more of a luxury and upper class feel. And so as you're going through that, I mean, you can obviously, you know, just put yourself in the mind of a renter walking into a 1980s building that's never been remodeled. You're going to have to charge less rent because it looks like 1980s. No one wants to live in that thing with popcorn ceilings and eight foot ceiling, all this kind of stuff. So we come in and we just make it modernized to 2022 USB chargers, technology, Nest thermostats, touch keypad locks, all that good stuff. So we justify being able to bump the rents a couple hundred a month over a few years, you know? And so we play musical chairs, (laughs) which means that when we buy a property, it's usually never a hundred percent occupied. So let's say it's 95 and it's a 200 unit. So you have 10 units vacant upon takeover. So we start renovating those 10 units And then we offer them up to the existing residents that already live at the community. 
at a premium, but a little bit of a discount from someone who would walk in the door from the street and want to rent. And so a lot of them take us up on the offer and they move units. And then we start renovating their old unit. And so we just kind of do this back and forth year by year until we get through at least most of the business plan. And then we look to sell the assets at that point. So from the LP side, do you want to see a GP with that same plan or does it need to be that extensive? It does not need to be that extensive and it all depends on the property. What we're seeing in more recent years, like this year and last year, is so many people have gotten in the space of value-add multifamily that a lot of what they've done is they'll buy a property, they'll renovate half the units, and then they'll try to sell it or they will sell it. And so when we buy a 200 unit, which is small for us, but if that's what we did, you only have 100 units to renovate. You know what I mean? And so the rest are already kind of modernized and look great. And so the business plans have have been getting shorter and the potential revenue has been getting smaller because everyone's moved to the rub systems and, you know, billing back the utilities and stuff to the tenants and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of people have been tuned into this message for a number of years. So 2015, we were finding those original vintage product value add plays, man, where it was like 600 units and not one has been touched in the last 20 years. It was incredible. So some of those returns were amazing. And now it's just been lessened because so many people are in the space. You only need to turn an apartment building like once every 10 years at most. So (laughs) the place that we spend a lot of time, our little niche at Ashcroft is that A lot of institutional buyers are looking for turnkey properties, whether that means that it's newly built or it's newly remodeled, and they don't have the headaches and the hassle. They don't have to get in and do value add. They just come in, they park their $100 million, and they collect a modest cash flow, and then they sell it when it starts having deferred maintenance and a lot of issues and things are outdated and they can't push the rents any further. And then we come in and we do our value add, and then we sell back to institutional buyers. That's mostly what we do. Right. Cool. What has been on this journey of you investing in syndications and other multifamily assets, what has been the most eye-opening experience from the LP side, other than you having a bunch more freedom than working a W-2? To me, man, that's my term. My term is time freedom. And it really was my motivator. I love to travel. So does my wife. We like to move. We just like to have flexibility over our lifestyle. And that really has been the biggest thing. And what I would tell other people is, it's not like you have to do what I do. It's not like you have to say, I'm going to invest in these things and I'm going to live off my passive income. You can just start building passive income. I mean, we're all going to need it eventually when we retire, right? So you're going to have to learn this game at some point. And hopefully it's not at 70 years old buying a bond and thinking that's all you can really do. So you can start to expand your lifestyle. You could do one investment as a diversification piece, for example, purposes. It gives you 2000 bucks a year in cash flow. Use that to go take an extra vacation. Use it to pay for your annual vacation, right? Use it to hire a house cleaner twice a month. You know, use it for outsource your landscaping so you don't have to mow your yard. You know, like you can start to really enhance the things. Here's my quote that I always say passive income allows you to do more of the things that you love and less of the things that you don't. And that's really how I live by that, man. And so we do it now, we've done it for years. We just look at our pain points in our lifestyle and we're like, all right, let's build up some cash flow and just pay for that headache because <laughs> I don't want to deal with that anymore. So, yeah. What's the best piece of advice for someone that is maybe on the fence about starting to invest in syndications that you could give to them, whether it's analyzing the GP or you know, get, yeah. doing a background check on the GP sure. and what would you tell them? I would tell them this. I would say in my personal opinion and experience... of the success comes from the general partnership. It's their ability to actually do what they say they're going to do, to actually execute the business plan, to actually be conservative, to actually under-promise and over-deliver, and to have the track record. It's 50% the people behind the scenes doing all the work. 25% is the market. Markets are very important. You could put the most experienced operator on a multifamily in a podunk town in the middle of Ohio. They're not going to have great results if it's not a city that's growing and expanding and has a lot of jobs. If it's all low income and fast food and gas stations, there's just not going to be a lot of potential for rent growth there. 
And then 25% would be the deal. The deal still is important. It needs to make sense. It needs to be strong bones and foundation and have a true value add component to it. So you need all three, but you know, I was in a deal in a good market. It was on a sub market of Atlanta in like 2016, roughly. And they bought at a good price, solid property, hundreds of units. Beautiful, man. Awesome. I was so excited for this deal. I went really heavy on it. Well, it was an operator I'd never worked with before, and they didn't really have much of a track record. And they hired a really bad property manager. And so that ran down the occupancy and collections. And then they were trying to I don't know, man. It got to be a mess. They were like fraudulently, you know, keeping money on the side and doing the books wrong. And it was a mess. So they fire them and then they counter, you know, they sue them. And then it was just this mess, this GP battle between the property manager and falling occupancy. It was a nightmare. So the GP just made mistake after mistake after mistake. And about, I don't know, a year and a half in, this is supposed to be a five year hold period. They just said, screw it. We're going to sell the deal. And they exited all of us LPs and we ended up with like maybe a 10% return when it was supposed to be a 20 plus percent IRR. So I'm not complaining at a 10% return. I'm happy with that. But it was 50% the general partner, you know, and that's important to think about. Awesome. Is there anything else you want to say today before we wrap it up? Ooh. You know, at the end of the day, whether we're talking about multifamily, single family, active, passive, whatever you're doing out there in the world, really consider passive income. I think there is a place for everybody to have some passive income in their portfolio. It doesn't matter if you're a doctor, a dentist, a real estate person, if you're 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, it can't hurt to have some extra cash flow rolling in every month. There's always something you can do to, I mean, give it away to charity, right? I and mean, give it to your kids, put your kids through school, whatever. Just have some allocation to passive income. And again, whether that's through REITs, whether it's through ATM machines, whether it's through vending machines, just do something that produces passive income is kind of the overarching message here. I always joke that if multifamily got so hot to where my cash flow potential was like 2% a year, but US Treasury bonds were paying me 8% a year, then I'm going to start investing in US Treasury bonds. You know what I mean? So don't get so tied to one thing that you're looking at the lens black and white. Just be flexible and adaptable and just go where the opportunity is. Mailbox money is a great thing. Indeed. Travis, where or if you want people to connect with you, where can they find you on social media? Yeah, so LinkedIn and Bigger Pockets, Travis Watts, W A T T S, on Instagram and Facebook. You can search at Passive Investor Tips, which is the name of my podcast that I run. I give a lot of free content away and I also give my time away in 15 minute blocks. So no upsell, no programs, no books, no courses. Just if you want to learn more about passive investing in general, you can go to ashcroftcapital.com forward slash Travis. And I've got my calendar link on there and we can do a Zoom call or a phone call. Your preference, your terms. Awesome. Travis, thank you again so much for joining me today. I know I learned a lot just looking at the syndication world from the GP lens. I've never really been in depth like this on the LP side before. So thank you again for sharing your knowledge and your insight and your experience. You bet, Trent. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast on WIN your community of investing knowledge for growth. We hope that this episode has increased your knowledge and added value to your path to freedom. If you would, please take a second to rate us so that we can get more great investors to interview. If you or someone that you know wants to be on, please visit westsideinvestors.com and fill out our form to be on the show. Thank you again and enjoy your day.